Welcome to the third annual Eric Schockett Memorial Lecture. I'm Norm Holland, the Dean of the School of Humanities, Arts, and Cultural Studies at Hampshire. Haku was Eric's academic home for 10 years, from 1996 until his untimely death in September 2006. Eric's presence was felt throughout the college. He was an active and much beloved member of Hampshire and the five college community. A nationally prominent scholar of American literature, his first book, Vanishing Moments, Class in American Literature, was published posthumously in 2006. Professor Schockett wrote primarily on issues of class consciousness and social stratification in America, as seen through and changed by the powerful lens of literature. On a more personal note, I had the honor and pleasure of teaching a memorable seminar on autobiography in the Americas with Eric. Well, it's true that he was deeply invested in an expansive notion of American studies, of rethinking American studies as America studies, Eric was also aware that the Americas was one, if not the, mo the principal site of a deliberate project to restore class, to restore upper class transnational power. It is well known that the Chicago School economists, students of Milton Friedman, applied the latter's free market utopia to Chile after the consolidation of power by Pinochet in 1975. This project was repeated in Argentina in the 1980s, in Mexico in the 1990s, and in the spring that we were teaching our seminar once again in Argentina. I suspect this afternoon's lecture will touch on this important dimension of Eric's amazing work. The annual Eric N. Schockett Memorial Lecture on Class and Culture was established to honor Eric's memory and to further the field to which he was so devoted. On behalf of my colleagues, I want to thank all of you who have so generously contributed to this initiative. I also want to acknowledge the hard work of my colleagues, Mary Russo, Michelle Hardesty, Christoph Cox, and Linda McDaniel for making possible this event. Now I would like to introduce my colleague, Professor Cox, who will introduce this afternoon's speaker, Professor Emeritus Richard Wolf. Christoph. It's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Rick Wolf and to have him here at Hampshire to deliver the third annual uh, Eric Schockett Lecture on Class and Culture. Eric had enormous admiration for Rick, and it was Eric who introduced me to him in the first place. The two of us, Eric and I, were co-teaching a course called Marx and, Marxism, Marx and Marxisms and trying to cover far too much material. The course met once a week, and we were about to be faced with the daunting task of teaching capital in two weeks. As the day approached, Eric said, um, with a kind of light bulb moment, I know, let's get Rick to do it, right? Um, if anybody can, if anybody can you know, do a crash course on capital uh, for lay readers in, in, in you know, quick time, it, it's Rick. Um, so Rick very generously a, a agreed to, to visit the class, and he proceeded not so much to teach capital, but to give the most astonishing, I don't, I don't know what to call it, other than a kind of Marxist pep talk, to a bunch of students who were there in the class to learn Marx, but not necessarily, let's say, with the program. And um, he managed to convince them that, that Marxism was not a kind of relic of the Cold War, um, that it was alive and well, and if I remember the example right, living in Silicon Valley, of, among other places, um, which I think both impressed and astonished and amazed a whole lot of people. Um, of course, I don't mean at all to suggest that Rick can't give a crash course on um, Marx and Marxism, and those of you who, I've been tremendously enjoying his, the audio lectures that he has on his website, rdwolf.com, if you want to give yourself that, that uh, crash course. Really, really very phenomenal. I'd recommend it to you highly. Rick is a very rare breed of intellectual and activist. He's a working economist who's also a Marxist, um, apparently not an oxymoron. Um, 
or a Marxian, I should say, as, as Rick likes to say. Um, he's someone equally dedicated to the most theoretical version of Marxism that, in, uh, uh, that comes from the tradition of Louis Althusser and Etienne Balabar, um, but also one who is invested in the most concrete and practical of real world cases and able to shuttle very keenly between the two. With his colleague Stephen Resnick, he's the author of a number of Marxian analyses of class, among them Knowledge and Class, a Marxian Critique of Political Economy from 1987, a textbook from the same year called Economics, Marxian versus Neoclassical, Class Theory and History, Capitalism and Communism in the USSR from 2002, and the most recent in this series, New Departures in Marxian Theory from a few years ago, 2006. Rick is a founder of the important journal, Rethinking Marxism, and a driving force behind its regular conference, which has brought such an amazing intellectual and artistic um, cultural set of programs to the Valley over the number of years in which it's been organized. Responding to the recent global financial crisis, Rick recently produced and featured in the documentary Capitalism Hits the Fan, a DVD put out by the uh, Media Education Foundation, and an accompanying book, Capitalism Hits the Fan, The Global Economic Meltdown, and What to Do About It. He's Professor Emeritus of Economics at UMass and currently teaches in the graduate program in International Affairs at the New School in New York City. Please join me in welcoming Professor Richard Wolf. Thank you very much for coming, for inviting me. It's a little scary to follow these kinds of introductions. I hope I won't disappoint you. Let me say a few things before I jump in. Yes, I am an economist. That gives me a sort of mixed feeling, good in some ways, ashamed in others. Uh, our profession has done things like invent reasons to support someone like Pinochet, immediately after he murders the then president of that country. Um, and it is a profession that has spent a lot more time making itself incomprehensible to everybody else than it should have. On the other hand, there are some folks who remember what the profession was and what it grew out of, which was an honest concern <clears throat> to understand what's going on in the world. Um, it is correct to call me an economist in that sense. I'm more with the second group than the first, as you'll see. I am not part of the Chicago School, which will probably be the greatest understatement of what I have to say. Uh, I am a Marxist. I did leave my horns at home, but it is true. I am a Marxist, and I find that a more persuasive set of arguments today than I ever have before in my life. The thing that's interesting, that we'll come back to perhaps at the end, is that my fellow Americans are finding it more interesting than at any point in my lifetime. Um, I retired from UMass a year and a half ago, and I have spent the last 12, 16 months uh, running around the world, literally, um, for the first time in my life as an adult uh, economist, uh, where it isn't me looking for opportunities to explain what a Marxist perspective is, it's everybody else wanting to hear what it is from someone who does it. And that is a very welcome change. And it is a development of class consciousness, which is what I want to talk about, and which I know from my conversations with Eric Schockett, he was so concerned with also. So let me turn to the things I have prepared to say. First about Eric, um, who was kind enough to invite me to his class and who spent time talking with me and I with him to what I believe was our mutual benefit and to the benefit of the group that produces that journal, Rethinking Marxism, that he was involved with as well. Uh, he was fascinated with class in American society. He was upset, as he told me repeatedly. He was upset that the United States, born in a sense out of a revolution that turned against feudalism, King George, all the old rigidities of class society as inherited from a thousand years of European history, the new world, the place that would be different. And what he said and what he felt was that whatever had been done here in the United States, whatever civil liberties had been created, whatever parliamentary system of checks and balances, he was deeply disappointed. This was a society that had not broken out of class rigidities that was stuck with obvious and gross inequalities of wealth and power, that they were not going away. And he found 
meaning in looking at those writers in American history, writers of fiction, writers of criticism, who at least recognized that, who at least broke with that tradition here in the United States that looks at the fact that we couldn't overcome so many of the inequalities and injustices of the past, not by denying the fact, by pretending that we're an exceptional place in the world where class doesn't exist, but by saying, yes, it does. And it's time for us to try to figure out why that is so we can change it. And he wrote that astonishing book, These Vanishing Moments, a really powerful book. For those of you who have not had a chance to read it, read it. It's a long effort with lots of erudition to try to face up very honestly, exceptionally honestly, to the question, did the writers in America, as diverse as Dreiser and T.S. Eliot and Meridel Lesur, different kinds of writers with different objectives coming out of different times, did they capture, finally, an understanding of class in America, why it exists, why it persists, why the efforts to get rid of it have failed? Honestly, why? And one of the conclusions he reaches, very powerfully articulated, is that they never really kind of understood what class was and how it was born and how it survived but that we can learn from all that they struggled with to try to understand. That's an amazing contribution, and that book makes that contribution very well. What inspired Eric, not surprisingly, if you're interested in class, was finding his way to Marx and Marxism. So I want to talk very briefly about that. In case you're wondering, all of this is a preparation for me to use Marxian economics, which is what I'm going to do for most of today, to have a conversation with you of the sort I used to have with Eric, in which I will use that theory to try to explain to you the crisis we're in and what's happening. But first, the background. Eric found his way to Marx and Marxism. Most people, especially if they're honest, and they start getting interested in class, find their way to Marx and Marxism and not for any difficult reason to understand. Marx wrote 150 years ago, roughly. What he wrote then was and remains one of the most profound intellectual engagements with answering the question, what is class? Why does class persist? Since Eric was asking exactly the same questions about the United States, it's, of course, appropriate that he would find his way to Marx and all the Marxists since who tried to figure it out. What do I mean? Marx was a child, intellectually, of the French Revolution. For him, being born in 1818, the most amazing thing was the end of feudalism. A thousand years of a stratified society of lord and serf, governed by a Catholic church, for the most part, that sanctified this way of organizing life. And Marx was enthralled with the French Revolution, with the idea that human beings would break such a system and reorganize society from the ground up so that it would be a society built around liberty, equality, and fraternity, the three great slogans. But being born in 1818, reaching maturity in the 1830s and 40s, Marx, like Eric, was very honest. Even though he was a child of well-heeled folks, one of the tiny number of people to get a university education in philosophy and go on to become, at least at the beginning of his life, a university professor, Marx looked around him in the Germany of his time, and one thing was clear. Liberty, equality, and fraternity was not what was going on. The French Revolution for Marx, like the American Revolution for Eric Schockett, hadn't been able to deliver what it had promised. So Marx set about like Eric did. Why? What happened here? And his basic conclusion was something like this as they articulated then in his most mature, complete work, which is the, the book Capital, 
critique of political economy. His argument went like this. In the past, for many years, we have had inequalities of wealth and power, the difference between rich and poor, between those who give orders and those who take them. And many good people have rebelled against those things and tried to change them. They tried in all kinds of ways. In the French Revolution, they tried as follows. They got rid of lords and serfs and kings. They substituted civil liberties, parliamentary democracy, the sanctity of private profit, private property and private profit, pro profit, sorry, and the market. This wonderful institution, they thought, that would allow people to enter only into voluntary relationships in their economic transactions, rather than being trapped as a serf because your parents were a serf, because their parents were a serf, and had no freedom of action in the economy. The French Revolution was bold. It made all those changes in the name of liberty, egality, egalité in French, and fraternité in French. It got civil liberties. It got the sanctity of the market and private property. It got capitalism instead of feudalism. But it didn't get liberty, equality, and fraternity. Leading Marx to say, not so surprisingly, that a transition from feudalism to capitalism is one thing. The achievement of liberty, equality, and fraternity is something altogether different. And not only is it not delivered by the transition to capitalism, but as I look around myself, Marx said, it seems to be blocked by capitalism. What's going on? What is it that has to be done that hasn't been done? What's missing? And Marx's answer, established in the three volumes of Capital, and beautifully worked out, particularly the first volume that Marx himself wrote. He was a great scholar. He loved Dante's Inferno. He loved Goethe. He loved all kinds of literature, and they're woven into the text. And unlike so many people in the economics field, he had an ability to write and a sense of humor. Uh, these things no longer being necessary and not being part of the curriculum. So Marx came up with an explanation, a really interesting one. He said, all my fellow radicals for a thousand years had tried to overcome inequalities of wealth and power, missed something. They did a lot of wonderful things. They made a lot of human progress, but they missed something. And here's what it is, he said. I figured it out. I have something to contribute. I am not just going to rail against unfair wealth and power. You really don't need me, he once said. Loads of people have been doing that for thousands of years. That the rich shouldn't have so much and the poor so little. That some people shouldn't have all the power and the masses have very little. I mean, you don't need me. But I figured out something that we haven't paid attention to. And he called it the surplus. Complicated English word. The German word is very simple. It's just a German word, M-E-H-R, more. It's not a complex idea. They run something like this. In every human community, Marx said, there are people who do work, who use their brains and their muscles to transform nature, to take a tree and make it into a chair, a sheep into a shirt. And the interesting thing, whenever you look at any society, Marx says, is when people do that, they always produce, as a total, as a total community of workers, they always produce more, M-E-H-R, the German word, mehr, more, they always produce more than they themselves consume. This is not a complex idea. I'm giving you the, the nutshell version because Marx did the work to figure it all out and present it in simple ways. That's how it's always possible in human communities for people to live who don't work. Because the people who do work produce more than they get. There's always a surplus produced by those who work. And those who work and produce a surplus, once you understand that and see it, then you, of course, ask the quick question, who gets the surplus and what do they do with it? And then Marx went to work. As Einstein had said, the answer is never the hard part. It's the question. 
The question of the surplus led him then to answer it, to see who gets it and what they do with it. And one of the first things, a kind of eureka moment for Marx, that Eric I knew appreciated because we talked about it, was when Marx said, well, it's really two possibilities. One possibility is that the people who produce a surplus, who make all the stuff, who make that extra beyond what they themselves consume, that those same people decide what to do with the work they've done, with the fruits of their labor. But the alternative arrangement is not that. The alternative arrangement is that there's one group of people in society who do the work and produce the surplus, and an entirely different group of people who get it and who distribute it and decide what to do with it. The first arrangement Marx preferred over the second. He didn't like it that you could have a production system in which a large number of people produce more than they get and the other group of people get it and decide what to do with it. His simple reasoning was that arrangement, and by the way, that's what he called exploitation, when the people who produce a surplus don't get it, don't get to decide what to do with it. And he said something that was another eureka moment. Now, he said, I know why all of the efforts of all the good-hearted people, whether they be rebels in ancient Rome, or literary figures in American history trying to understand the persistent inequalities of America. I know, says Marx, why those inequalities persist. Because the underlying production system continues to be exploitative, continues to be a system in which the majority of people come to work nine to five, five days a week, and produce more than they get, which an entirely different group of people get their hands on and decide what to do with. And now the punchline. If you don't change the organization of production, you're never going to get rid of the inequalities of wealth and power that haunt modern societies in just the way Eric showed for American history, and that Marx made the focus of his attack in the rest of his adult life. It is a profound argument. And the profundity of the argument may have something to do with a simple historical reality. From the time Marx figured this out, 150 years to today, what do we know? From an insight and an argument that was developed by a few exiles in London. Marx had been thrown out of Germany by then. These ideas have spread to every country on the face of this earth. Every country has Marxist journals, Marxist parties, Marxist trade unions, Marxist movements. You name it, Marxists have gotten into it everywhere. In the history of the human race, very few comparable movements have spread so far, so fast. Now, if this were a conversation three years ago, Eric's still with us, it would have been awkward for me to say what I just said. What a different time. In 2004, 5, and 6, we had a capitalism that was very sure of itself. It had overcome all of its earlier foibles. It was racing along. There was no alternative. The Soviet Union had collapsed. China was trying to be like the US, etc., etc. Everything was wonderful. And all those criticisms of capitalism that 100 or 200 years of its life had given rise to had somehow all been blown away. Boy, is it different now. So let me turn and try to use Marx's analysis, his class analysis, to understand this crisis in a historical way. So along the way, I can help answer the question Eric was working to try to answer about class in America. 
and why so many people need to believe it isn't there, and why even those who faced it couldn't quite figure out why it stayed, as well as to explain the crisis we're in. The best way to begin is to make sure we all are on the same page about the crisis. It is supposed to have started officially, according to government statistics, in December of 2007. At that time, the official unemployment rate in the United States counted 7 million Americans looking for work and unable to find it. Here we are, two and a third years later. The number of people officially counted by the government as unemployed is 15 and a half million people. Double, more than double, what it was then. If you read in the newspaper about recovery, scratch your head. Because the number's gotten worse and worse and worse. No recovery for those folks. Not even the beginning of one. The Bureau of Labor Statistics keeps another number, another kind of unemployment number, and they add together three groups. The people I just mentioned, unemployed looking for work. And they add two others people who are on a part-time job but want a full-time job. That is, they're not making money the way they need it. And the third group, and here you have to enjoy the name, are called discouraged workers. Now, in case you think these are workers who don't feel good today, it's not that. These are people who have looked for months and have given up. They're not looking anymore. The Bureau of Labor Statistics tells us today April 2010, that the percentage of our unemployed, of our, excuse me, the percentage of our workforce that is either unemployed, underemployed in a part-time job, or have given up, is 17 percent, one out of six. That means every American family has either a member or a relative or a neighbor who's in that situation. That's a disaster. That's not an economic downturn. That's not a business cycle. That's, not something, that's a disaster in people's lives. But we're not done. The number of court cases beginning the process of foreclosure, that's when you throw people out of their home because they can't afford it anymore, is now running at about 225,000 per month in the United States. New ones. According to the government, the capacity utilization rate in the United States today, that is the percentage of the tools, equipment, machines, factory space, office space that's being used is about 66%. That means one third of our capacity to produce is sitting idle, rusting, collecting dust. Okay, let's put that together. Tens of millions of people who want to work. A vast array of equipment and space, machines and tools for them to work with. And an amazing array of social needs we could get fulfilled if the people who want to work were could put, be put together with all the equipment they need and all the raw materials. But we live in an economic system that can't do it. You don't need Marx to make a criticism of capitalism. You're in it. Look around you. Marx will just help you understand why, but you don't need him to understand that it's there. It's an astonishing failure to perform. Are we done? No. One more dimension of the crisis. In every state in the Union, with one exception that I know of, but in 49 out of 50 states, we're just at the beginning of this collapse as the revenues are falling because people don't have work, because houses are losing value, the money flowing to the state, the money flowing to the city and the town are collapsing. So everywhere, states and cities and towns are faced with a catastrophic dilemma. They haven't the money to continue doing what their people expect of them. So they really got two choices. One, they can go find someone else to raise taxes on them to make up for the lost taxes because of our crisis. Two, they can cut programs. They don't have the money, they cut the programs. California, our greatest state, our largest state, is leading the way, laying off, ready, tens of thousands of teachers, social workers, police officers, fire, you name it. 
astonishing. I just came back last week from the Bay Area, and it, 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 it exceeds anything I had read about. And it's happening everywhere, including this state. There is one exception. For those of you who want to imagine that it's possible to go a different way, let me tell you a story. Last summer, a little state in America, by the name of Oregon, did something different. The legislature there passed a bill. I didn't make this up, by the way. They passed a bill last summer, and the bill said the following. We do not want to have here in Oregon what they have south of us in California, because that's a disaster. So we don't want to have any cuts of anything. Not teachers, not so, nothing. And so here's what we have to do. We have to raise money another way, a new way, to make up for all the money not being paid into the state because of unemployment and home foreclosures and all the rest. And we have a way. We're going to tax corporations and rich people. We're going to jack up the rates on everybody who makes more than $250,000, and even more, anyone who makes over $500,000. I can see some of you already cringing with fear. <laughs> the legislature, to the surprise of everybody, passed the bill, both houses. The governor signed it last summer. Now, Oregon has something that we more sophisticated people in the East don't need and don't want. They have something called the right to referendum. If you're not happy with something the government does, it's very easy to put it on the ballot so that everybody gets to vote. Obviously, we don't need that. Um, but the, those strange people in the West, they, they want that, they insist on that. So Oregon, the Republican Party, the business community, and a good number of my colleagues in economics got together and said, you can't do this, this is terrible, this is not, uh, it's awful. There must be a referendum, and they did what was necessary to have one. In January of this year, the vote was held in Oregon. 1.2 million citizens in Oregon went to the polls and enthusiastically endorsed the bill. That's the law in Oregon. I'm sure you're all very happy that here in Massachusetts, you wouldn't have any of that. <laughs> but there are people who see a different way. But for most Americans, it's disaster time. In New York City, we have a wonderful, I live in New York City now, we have a wonderful situation. Our governor, a Democrat, uh, has proposed that one of the things to be done to save money is to stop allowing school children to use the public transportation of New York, as they've been doing for decades, without paying for it to get to and from school. So there's an important kind of way of dealing with our economic crisis. You get over the crisis in the short run by shooting yourself in the foot in the long run by undercutting your education program. Tells you a lot about a society that can think through a solution to a problem in that particular way. So let me turn then, briefly, because we don't have a lot of time, to an analysis of how we got into this catastrophic mess. It is, by the way, the second collapse of American capitalism in 75 years. We had another big one in the 1930s. It was even worse than this one. On the other hand, it took much more courageous action to cope with that crisis than we have yet to take here. And in case you think, well, maybe it's not so bad, two in 75 years, between the end of the Great Depression and the beginning of the crisis in 2007, the National Bureau of Economic Research counts a dozen economic downturns. As I like to say to my students over the years, if you lived with a person as unstable as this economic system, <laughs> you'd move. <laughs> or you'd demand that your roommate get some professional help. But we, interestingly, live with an economic system where we make neither effort. And you ought to wonder why. So let's turn to the crisis. I think the crisis is as bad as it is, is lasting as long as it is, and will continue to plague this society for decades to come, because it is not a temporary blip. It comes out of a long history. And because I need to talk at the end about Eric Schockett and his work again, I want to take you very briefly through that history. Bear with me. I'm going to subject you to the economics profession's favorite game, which is writing lines on the board that connect dots. <laughs> 
Economists are underdeveloped people. They enjoyed so much that game that three-year-old and four-year-old and five-year-old children play, the dots, you draw the lines. Stunted development means you become a mature economist, you're still doing that all the time. This is an interesting one. It starts around 1820 and it goes to around 1970. 150 years during which, during which the wages of American workers rose every decade. It's an amazing story. It's probably a better delivery of goods and services to a working class than was achieved in any other country and it has something to do with why so many immigrants came here. They were leaving where it wasn't like this and coming to where it was. Amazing. And because the wages kept going up, we can understand with Eric Schockett why for that period of time it would be possible for so many Americans to kind of fudge the presence of inequality of wealth and income. Because you could kind of believe, well, soon I won't have the problem. I will be soon because it's going up all the time, it's getting better, I'm working harder, true, but I'm doing better, and you know, that's maybe more important than where I actually am in relationship to other people. You could kind of understand it. Maybe you wouldn't get a class consciousness in such a society. During the same period of time, I'm gonna draw another line. That line we call productivity in the United States. Simple idea, it measures for the same period of time, how much more goods and services a worker was producing for his or her employer per hour. So think of it this way. This line is what the workers were producing for their employer, and this line is what the employers were paying the workers to do it. And the lines are different because the workers produced for the employer mm, more than they got back, which is what Marx called this surplus. Okay. Now suppose, suppose in a culture that for 150 years had been enjoying rising standard of living because workers got paid more. They got paid more and they could afford to buy more. And by the way, there's no mystery why they got paid more. They got paid more because we had a labor shortage here all the time. We didn't have an, capitalism was successful here. We were always running out of workers. That's part of why we had to bring endless waves of them from elsewhere. And we had another problem that made you have to pay higher wages. If the worker wasn't happy with the wages you paid, you ran away to the West. We had cleared the land. That's a polite term for killing people. We had ethnically cleaned our society, and so we had a lot of free land, free of people. And, and workers could run away and have a farm someplace. So in order to keep your worker, to get him and to keep him, you had to keep raising the wages. But the workers weren't told that. They were simply told, you live in a special place, a charming place, an exceptional place, America, where if you come and you work hard, it happens for you. This was very useful. It meant, if you were religious, that God loved you, you particularly. <laughs> and it also meant that if you weren't doing better all the time, it was your fault. Set up for you, it's awful. Something wrong with you. It also meant that Americans believed they were entitled to the American dream, to do better, to give their children a better life than they themselves had and their grandchildren still better. It was built in. If you're a good parent, you deliver better to your kid. Became a measure, rising standard of living, of the American success. We became a country obsessed with consumption. Because it was the standard. It wasn't that we like to eat a lot of food. It was the standard of our success, of our having arrived. Try to imagine in a culture for 150 years that internalizes all I've just said, if, if the following were to happen. Around 1970, that becomes the story of wages in America. And did I write it up there to hurt your feelings? No, because that's what happened. <laughs> The real wage, the actual bundle of goods and services that an average American gets for an hour of work today is about what it was in 1978. For an entire generation, more than, American workers could no longer have the American dream. 
could no longer deliver it to their children, could no longer think of themselves as successful because the measure of it, consumption, was blocked by no more wages. Briefly now, real briefly, what did the American working class do? Well, this problem was a trauma to them. A doubly bad trauma because it couldn't be discussed. There was no national discussion, no national recognition, no national debate. Every family in, went through this experience as if it was a personal problem of theirs, so they tried to solve it as a personal problem. A little hint, you try to solve social problems with personal solutions, you're going to be a very unhappy person. And we are. What did Americans do? Two things that are very important. One, they went to work. You know, if you're not getting any more per hour solution, more hours. Today, Americans work more hours per year than any other working class in the world. The UN and the OECD keep these records. We work more hours in the United States than the Japanese or anybody else. We are workaholics as a nation. Most important in these 30 years was one particular group of Americans who really went to work, adult women. Because of the women's liberation movement and a thousand other things, they left the home in order to keep the family able to consume more. <coughs> And with mother leaving the house, mother having kept together the emotional life of the family, we had two phenomena over the last 30 years. An exhausted working class, physically, medically, and a working class whose entire emotional life was falling apart. There's a reason why Republicans were able to make political gain by talking about family values, because everybody's family was falling apart. The dumb Democrats never figured it out. The Republicans did. And they made, they made real use of it, didn't they? By 2007, what have we got? An exhausted and emotionally stressed working class. A working class which finds it funny that half of every program on television is about a dysfunctional family. We all have to laugh at them because what else are we going to do? But that wasn't enough. It turned out when mother went out to get a job, she needed another set of clothing. Because we don't have a public transportation system worth anything, she had to get a second car. The net income wasn't enough. So the American working class over the last 30 years took the second step to allow itself to continue consuming. It borrowed more money than any working class in the history of the world has ever borrowed before. You know, if you borrow money, you can keep consuming even if your wages don't go up. That's what they did. So by 2007, they're physically exhausted, they're emotionally stressed, and they all know, with an anxiety level ready to blow their minds, that they're carrying more debt than they can ever pay back. And the system blows up because it can't, it can't continue. You can't borrow anymore, you can't work anymore, and the wages are going nowhere. So it's over. A terrible awareness that's all over the United States. It's over. What did the employers, what was their situation? I, I do this now because I don't want you to get depressed at what I've been saying. <laughs> so I'm going to turn to the good news, which if you're lucky, you had something to do with. But even if you weren't able to participate, you can enjoy seeing how it helped other people. If you're an employer, you don't need advanced economics for this. By the way, advanced economics only make it harder for you, <laughs> given what it is. So what happened here? The employees became more productive. Why? Over the last 30 years, they got computers to work with. They were harder, they were made to work harder and faster and longer. They were trained better, educated better. For all those reasons, the productivity line keeps rising. The workers became more productive. Hello, let's look at what it means to have two lines that diverge. It's not quite the Robert Frost poem, but <laughs> what we as workers, I will be so bold as to assume we're mostly that in the room, what we as workers keep doing is giving more and more per hour of our labor to the employer to sell. We're more productive, that's what that means. We produce more stuff during the day. 
Then, as you recall from your job, at the end of the day, you go home, but whatever you produce, it stays there. And if you take it with you, people in blue uniforms come and hurt you. <laughs> so you don't do that. You leave it there. It belongs to the employer. So what we deliver to the employer gets bigger and bigger, and what the employer gives us doesn't. At this point, if we had more time, I'd play the national anthem. <laughs> well, let's see what it means. Let's see what it means. Let's see what it means. The difference, the surplus that workers deliver to the employer. Hear the Marxism? The surplus <laughs> that workers deliver to the employer is going up and up. The employers discover in the 1970s nirvana, or as close as you can get. Spectacular. Look at this. And the employers do something for which you really have to appreciate them as a group. They announced in the 1970s that this explosion of profits and, and wealth for them is a result of their own <coughs> entrepreneurial genius. <laughs> we suddenly discover Lee Iacocca, the genius of Chrysler and Ford. Jack Welch here in Massachusetts, the genius of General Electric. What? What? This has nothing to do with genius. This is about not paying people anymore. Which you do not need to be a genius to do. But it's very smart to claim it's the genius of the entrepreneur, the top managers, because if it's them and their genius that explain it, well, then it would be reasonable to pay them accordingly. So starting in the 1970s, that's when it started, Americans, corporations, began paying their top executives wild sums of money, bonuses and stock options. Yeah, I know that many of you have gotten very angry over the last year and a half when you've read about these bonuses. I'm very glad you're angry. It's just you're 30 years late. <laughs> Where were you all along? Well, maybe you didn't understand this, and you didn't. And you know why you didn't? Because you're not smart? No, of course not. <coughs> because in order to set it up this way, you need Marxist theory because it leads you to look at it this way. So suddenly you can explain why this happened. Every time capitalism has produced a sustained period of time of big profits to the wealthy, they always do the same thing. They go off into a speculative hysteria. They become so wealthy that they get freaked out and try to figure out how to make even more money. In the, since the 1970s, a whole new set of enterprises were established. With these people being paying themselves huge salaries, these wealthy managers and the shareholders who got big dividends, they accumulated vast amounts of money. Take a look at all the statistics on the unequal wealth over the last 30 years. The top 1 or 5% have gotten very, very wealthy, and everybody else is about the same. What did those very wealthy people do? They, they were accumulating so much money, they, they didn't have the time or the energy or the expertise to know how to invest this money. So a whole new set of enterprises grew up whose job it is to go to rich people and say, I'll do that for you. We call them hedge funds. That's what they do. And they did it. And now I'm going to tell you the thing they did that's the most fun to understand. Because if you do, you will understand why the United States is a class society and can't get rid of it. These wealthy people took a good portion of the money they got because the workers weren't being paid any higher wages, and they lent the money to the workers. Remember before I told you how the working class borrowed like crazy? Now I'm telling you where they borrowed from. These folks took all that money, put it in a bank. The bank is stuck with all these deposits. It has to lend it out. So it has to come to a way, and it realizes it's got a desperate American working class. It's been traumatized by 150 years of rising standard of living. The mere fact that you're not raising its wages anymore doesn't mean it's going to stop wanting to buy more, to have more, to pay for the education for their kid. So they're desperate to consume more in the only way available, by borrowing more. All they need is someone to lend it. 
Mm, these folks oblige. <laughs> Therefore, for 30 years, what have we got? We've got nirvana for business. Instead of paying your workers more, as you've been doing for 150 years, you don't anymore. Instead of paying them more, you give them a loan, which they have to pay back to you with interest. At this point, I play the national anthem again. <laughs> that is an amazing arrangement to be able to pull that off. But they did. This was so profitable that they went crazy. That is, as people in charge of vast stores of wealth, they badly managed it. They lent it to workers who couldn't possibly pay it back in large quantities. They invented new instruments, which they didn't even understand, and invested in them. In other words, their behavior was as irresponsible in terms of its economic effects as it was to stop raising wages. And of course, the predictable result. If these people are physically exhausted, emotionally stressed, and can't handle their debts, and these people are wildly speculating as if they could, it will fall apart, which it did. No surprise. With what result? Well, I began by telling you about the unemployment, the foreclosures, and the collapse. What has happened in this culture? Very interesting, and I'll close with that. If you use this kind of analysis, you can understand that wealth in the United States is able to reproduce itself over time. And the absence of wealth is unfortunately over, also reproduced over time. But you also understand power. One example, the last 30 years, 70s to now, what happened was a working class that wasn't paid any more wages that now went into more and more work. Women leaving the home with all of the adjustments that that implies. Anxiety over the debts that can't be paid back. What did people do? They withdrew from political involvement and from social involvement. Some of you know the book by Robert Putnam over at Harvard with that funny title, Bowling Alone. The American masses withdrew from social activity. Most important, they withdrew from politics. Machine politics atrophy almost everywhere. People stopped going to meetings. People stopped participating in the Democratic or Republican Party. And pretty soon they lose interest. Why pay attention to what those clowns are doing when you're not even involved in it anymore? So the mass of American workers withdrew from politics to deal with life under these horrific conditions. And at the same time that they withdrew, these people had more money than ever to throw into politics. This is the time when suddenly campaigns start costing wild sums of money because they have it to give. This is the time when every legislature at every level is surrounded by armies of lobbyists paid by this. We didn't have a shift to the right in American politics. We had a change of participation. The people who make up the center and the left withdrew and for the same reasons that the right moved in big time. That's why we have a politics in which polls of the mass of people tell them, get out of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. But they're not going to do it. Because these people are not so interested in that. It's not about change of political point of view. It's about who plays the political game in this culture, and that's shaped here. So the distribution of power, like the distribution of wealth, is fundamentally shaped, not only, of course, but is powerfully shaped by the class structure of production. And I think that's slowly, and I underscore the word slowly, beginning to enter the popular consciousness. I don't think the fact that what Eric Schockett did here is unconnected to all of this. I know he was interested, and we discussed these things. I'm equally aware that a few miles up the road from here at UMass in the economics department, that the work that I was able to do with my colleague Steve Resnick, who was kind enough to come and is sitting over there, and we did all this work together, that we also found our way 
to a reading of Marx as having taught this story, a story which we could tell, then develop and take further and apply. <coughs> and then there are others here in the room who have run with that ball and teach it in various schools that I know you that are here that I appreciate. But it's an extraordinary development. But it's not just, and here I will end, it's not just among intellectuals and academics that this awareness of the relevance of the organization of production, what we call the class organization, how it's organized around the surplus. But the final point, imagine with me, as Marx did, what it might mean if the organization of production were not such that a mass of people produces surplus, the workers, and a tiny group of people get it and decide what to do with it. In our culture, that tiny group is called the board of directors. 15 to 20 people that sit at the top of every corporation, they make the decisions what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the surplus or the profits. They are selected and responsible to something called the major shareholder. That's another group of 15 or 20. Together, they run the show. Now imagine with me if that weren't the case. <clears throat> imagine with me if the transition of the American and French revolutions, to go back to our beginning, was not a transition from the landlord, the feudal landlord, who got all the surplus into his hands produced by the serf. Suppose the transition hadn't been to capitalism, which turned out to be not that different because it still had a group of workers, not called serfs anymore, free men and women, whom we call proletarians, were produ producing a surplus, you just saw that, for another small group of people, not feudal lords, but capitalist employers. Imagine if that hadn't been the transition. Imagine if in the United States or Russia or anywhere else, the following had happened, that workers having red marks and learned it, said, no, 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 we, we would actually like a, a different arrangement. We would like production to work as follows. Monday to Thursday, we're going to come to work, make hamburgers, shirts, software programs, whatever. But Friday, we will come to work, like we do the other four days, but on Friday, we're going to all sit around at the workplace and have meetings. And during those meetings, together, one person, one vote, we're going to decide what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the profits that we, in our labor, produce. Oh, imagine a non-exploitative arrangement in which the people who produce the surplus are identical to those who get and distribute it. Let's do that. Just briefly. Suppose in 1970, that's how our corporations worked. Here's a guess. They wouldn't have stopped raising wages. Right? The workers would have said, gee, the productivity's going up. We've been doing real fine for 150 years raising wages. Why should we stop raising wages now? And if the wages hadn't gone down, well, then the borrowing wouldn't have had to commence, would it? Gee. And if the borrowing didn't commence, you might not have had Wall Street go crazy with instruments developed on the basis of that borrowing. Wow. Here's another thing that workers in charge might not have done. Might not have moved production out of the United States to China. Probably not. We would have had a different economic history because our organization of the surplus would have been different. Christoph kindly reminded me at the beginning with his kind introduction that he had heard the story before about Silicon Valley. So let me end with that. Every year for the last 50 years, a group of engineers in Silicon Valley, different people, leave big corporations like IBM and Cisco Systems and all that. They quit. And together with a group of others, 10, 20, 30, 40, they take their laptops and they gather in someone's garage. And they explain, we don't want those jobs. And they get paid well at those jobs. We don't want those jobs. We can't stand coming to work in a tie and a jacket. It's awful. We can't stand being told what to do as workers by some supervisor who's only there because he's the cousin of the owner. We want to be able to come to work in a Hawaiian shirt, in Bermuda shorts, 
and with a nice collection <coughs> of marijuana cigarettes. <laughs> and you know something they say? In this new situation, we are all the same. There's no boss, there's no underling, there's no supervisor. We're all equal here. Monday to Thursday, we come and we make software, and on Friday, we get together to decide, that's where I got the idea, that what we're going to do and how we're going to do it and what we're going to do with the profits. Interesting. They claim three things. One, we are much happier human beings doing work this way than we ever were before. Number two, we are much more productive at our work because of it. And number three, it's these kinds of firms, they point out, that have made most of the breakthroughs in technology in the last 30 years. Well, this kind of an enterprise, which is a communal effort of the communal group, the collective group of the workers themselves, these are interesting words, <coughs> collective, communal, you might give them the name communist. This is what they are. They're a communist organization of the surplus. But the funny thing is, when you talk to these engineers who've done this, who voted with their feet, they quit a capitalist enterprise and they formed a communist enterprise. When you explain that to them, which I've done, they look at you with horrified pain. <laughs> and they explain, with tears running down the face, but I'm a Republican. <laughs> Which many of them are. But the beauty of that takes me back to Eric Schocken. They think what they're doing is entrepreneurial innovation. I don't care. They could call it a yellow circus hat. <laughs> what they're telling me is they, like Eric, came to an understanding, however dim at the beginning, Eric's was, Eric's was much more developed, of a Marxist theory of a surplus and of what a communist enterprise would look like different from it. They're finding their way because of the impossibilities for them personally of the capitalist system. And they've been doing this before we had the crisis <laughs> we're in now. Of course our government, being our government, is not thinking about a solution in terms of changing the organization of production. Like those engineers in Silicon Valley, our leaders have no idea about what this argument entails. Why not? Because for the last 40 years in this country, those of us who have found something interesting in the Marxist tradition to use, to analyze, to teach, so we all have that as a mental equipment to solve our problems, have been mostly denied the opportunity to teach and speak. So we shouldn't be surprised that neither Mr. Obama, nor the engineers in Silicon Valley, nor Larry Summers, <laughs> have any idea what I'm talking about? They don't. So here's what they're going to do instead. They're going to throw huge amounts of money at banks to try to solve the problem. They're going to borrow huge amounts of money around the world to give to the banks in order to solve the problem. They've been doing that for the two years during which unemployment keeps rising and foreclosures keep rising. Interesting. We now owe the People's Republic of China, I only picked them because they're the largest creditor of the United States, we now owe them about a $1.3 trillion. Okay? That means we as a nation are paying interest on that debt. If you calculate 4% interest per year, $1.4 trillion, do the arithmetic. It means that our federal government in the United States is every year collecting 50 or $60 billion from you and you and you and me and acting as a collection agency to collect the $60 billion and send them over to Beijing. So on behalf of the People's Republic of China, thank you. <laughs> That's an interesting way to solve the problem. Last thing is being discussed right now in Washington, regulation. You'll forgive me. This is really disgusting. Every president since Franklin Roosevelt has said the following. 
It's outrageous what this speculation has done. It is terrible. They shouldn't do this. And I am going to pass stringent regulations on the financial sector, not only to get us out of this crisis, but to make sure this never happens again. Every president has promised it, and none of them have ever delivered. That's why we're in a crisis again now. <coughs> regulate what? You're going to regulate business. My conclusion, if you regulate business, you're regulating the board of directors. What does the board of directors, what is it there for? To make money for the corporation. The regulations imposed by the government are just some more problems. Their job is to get around those problems, that's called evasion, or weaken the rules, or get rid of the rules. Not only do they have every incentive to do that, but because the surplus of our culture flows into their hands, they also have the resources to realize what they have an incentive to do, which, guess what, is what they have done the last 30 years with a systematic erasure of all the regulations put into effect in the 1930s. First time, maybe it's our ignorance. To do it again, <coughs> that's outrageous. That's childish. We know the only difference now will be that the corporations who've had the last 40 years to learn how to get around these regulations will now be able to do it faster and more smoothly with more ideological cover because they've learned how. We're going to have a big debate. But notice in the country the big debate is about regulation. Not a word about any of the fundamental structural conditions of our production system as they contributed to not only this crisis, but to a set of solutions to the crisis that reinforce and, re and continue what so bedeviled Eric the persistent inequalities of wealth and power. If you understand the flat wages, you'll know that growing inequality produced the crisis. But the crisis itself has more deepened inequality than even the run up to it. Over the last three years, the only asset that the mass of the American working class ever has is their home. The collapse of home prices, which are roughly down about a third, has taken the poor, the middle, and taken from them the little bit of asset they have. In a sense, in the 30 years before the crisis, they stayed the same and the rich got richer. The effect of the crisis is that the poor get poorer. You wonder why class is a repressed discourse in our culture? The answer is that for the mass of people, it's an explosive discourse. It focuses attention on a fundamental problem that has bedeviled those writers in American history sensitive enough to face class analysis. The very writers that Eric Schockett studies so brilliantly. And Eric wasn't afraid at the end of his book to say they tried to understand it, but they couldn't. They failed. We can learn from their failure, but they never asked the underlying structural questions about why that happened. And he found his way to me as I found my way to Steve Resnick, and all of us found our way back to what Marx had to teach because it was a way, finally, to look at what creates and sustains class. And that growing consciousness whether it be in the bizarre form of Republican engineers in San Jose, or Eric working here on literature, or Resnick and I in economics up the road, there is a change happening as capitalism, as it has always done before, provokes its own critics. And for me, that's the best possible news that I could have brought to Eric or that I can bring to you about the situation we're in. Thank you very much.